Back to My Garden, episode 75. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here's Dave Ledoux. Are you concerned about toxic chemicals, GMOs, and frankenfood? Don't panic. Grow organic. Discover my new resource for organic gardening. Go to www.backtomygarden.com front slash myorganic. Attention garden lovers. Do you want to save time, save money, and have your most amazing garden ever? Receive free tips, strategies, and gardening techniques from passionate gardeners around the world. Join the VIP club for free today at www.backtomygarden.com front slash VIP. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when you listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux, and welcome to another episode of Back to My Garden. We have a tremendous guest today, folks. Catherine has the gift. She works with passionate people to design and beautify their spaces. From container gardens and lawns to edible gardens with pollinators, Catherine creates beautiful reality from imagined vision. From teaching to speaking, Catherine enjoys all aspects of the creative gardening process. We have a lot to talk about. Please welcome from Devon in the United Kingdom, Catherine Alto. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Dave. I'm excited that you're here. Thanks. It's nice to be here. I gave you a very brief introduction. I want to hear your stories and our listeners want to get to know you as well. Uh, Catherine, take a minute or two and just share with our listeners a little bit about your background and how did you get into gardening? Well, let's see. I grew up with um, a father who has a very green thumb. He was an ag teacher, agricultural high school teacher in Central California. And um, he, so he taught agriculture, but he was also a garden designer on the side. And so I um, love drawing like my dad. I have some spatial ideas like, like he does. Um, and so it started there, just putting marigolds in the garden when I was five or six or seven and um, just being fascinated by the natural world. And I'm also quite visual. So even as a youngster, I was um, really drawn to color and movement of grasses and plants. Um, But when I was about 10, I had a wonderful fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Blixt, and she had descriptive writing exercises. She would ask us to take images of the landscape and gardens and ask us to write descriptively about them. And I thought to myself, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to write pretty words about landscapes and gardens. And um, so one thing led to another, and um, I ended up um, getting a, a, a bachelor's and a master's in, in English with an interest in American literature of nature and place and um, taught in the Pacific Northwest at a community college for 15 years and moved to Devon, England in 2007. And um, I pursued uh, a diploma at the London College of Garden Design and a master's in garden history at the University of Bristol. Um, and that's, that's how it's come about. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, for those of you listening, your internet is not broken. You probably picked up Catherine has a Seattle accent and not a Devon accent. I want you to make sure now if you're driving, keep both hands on the wheel. Catherine and I are going to talk about garden design and all kinds of fun stuff, but I'll take the notes for you. I'll put the notes up and the resources and the links up at Back to My Garden, so just listen, uh, listen along. Make sure you follow Catherine on social media, on Twitter at Catherine Alto. Now make sure I spell this right, Catherine. It's K-A-T-H-R-Y-N-A-A-L-T-O. That's right. Two A's Angel. in Alto. And of course, you have an amazing website, blog, um, links up at www.catherinealto.com. Maybe a good place to start is uh, compare and contrast your life now, moving from the Pacific Northwest where you gardened you know, on acreages for 15 years to now being up in one of the most beautiful parts of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Um, well, here in Devon, um, surprisingly, we get 10 inches less rain than we did where we lived outside of Seattle. Um, so people say, oh, you know, the English are famous about talking about the weather, and they are. They talk about the weather a lot. But the Seattleites can definitely give them a run for their money. Um, there's a lot of 
a lot of similarities in culture, you know, coffee, tea, and lots of rain. Um, um, so Devon is, um, reminds me a lot of Northern California, the Northern California coastline above sort of Marin, Mendocino, and that kind of thing. It's got a beautiful rugged coastline. It reaches from the English Channel all the way up to the Bristol Channel in uh, uh, near S South Wales. Um, let's see, in terms of so that's it in terms of, uh, you know, f uh, weather. Um, it's, it's very, very green here. It kind of looks like Teletubby land um, a bit, if people are familiar with those old, that um, children's show. Really pretty green rolling hills, ancient hedgerows, um, ancient oak trees everywhere. Um, it's, a, it's an area that isn't really, wasn't really sculpted during the glacial period, so it's really rolly and, and um, lots of hills. Um, whereas Seattle is a majestic landscape with Mount Rainier in the background, and it's it's colder. You generally get snows in in, in the Seattle area, um, and um, here it's much, I would say, more temperate. Um, yeah. My f thinking about the United Kingdom, England doesn't take anything lightly when it comes to gardening. They do it at a level that. In Canada, we can't even imagine. Have you found that is part of their culture? They really love their gardening? Uh, yeah. Well, it started, um, you know, you have these old, you know, ancient historic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ancient um, landscapes around castles and, and Elizabethan gardens. Um, and then you had the great plant hunters were hired by English um, nurseries. So here in Exeter, for example, the Veatch Nursery um, sent out plant hunters all over the world. In fact, uh, in a, a section of Exeter, there is a sort of like a commemorative garden to these various plant hunters who went all around. So, um, and then English gentlemen would go on grand tours um, in this, you know, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. They'd go down to Italy and... Um, would tour great gardens down there and bring some ideas back to England. And so there's, England is just a, a, a rich tapestry of um, gardening textures in a way. Uh, lots of, it's, I, I think really Capability Brown was the person who really um, sculpted the landscape in sort of a more picturesque uh, English uh, way. But before that, there were, you know, these gentlemen who went to Italy and, and, and wanted to recreate Italian landscapes here. And, and eventually, you know, you, you, um, England is not as hot as, as Italy. Um, and so things were adapted and changed over time. So in terms of history, it's definitely a part of the English um, um, culture. Um, but even now, um, you can, you know, go to a garden center and find people obsessing over various things. And, of course, the Chelsea Flower Show is here, and that brings it to a whole different level. Um, and I've, I haven't shown there yet, but I will in probably, 20, hopefully, 2016, I have a, a garden proposal I'm putting together now. Um, but I've been many times, and this year I helped a young designer I work with. His name's Hugo Bug. Um, he's the young, youngest designer ever in RHS history to win a gold, and... Um, uh, so I was uh, a bit of an assistant for him and, um, and helped out that way. Um, oh, that is cool. <laughs> uh, Hugo Bug, B-U-G? B-U-G-G. G-G, okay. We'll see if we can give him a link. Yeah. I'm so happy you used the phrase plant hunter as a career choice. I mean, you jump on a plane now with a plant in your suitcase, you could go to jail. But for centuries, this was a noble profession. It was a noble profession, and um, it was really exciting. I am actually slightly obsessed with David Douglas, um, uh, a la da uh, the Douglas um, uh, uh, fir tree, and um, he was he was quite quite a wild man. There's other, there's other other many other um, uh, plant hunters as well who would um, you know practically go out in a a tuxedo. Um, but David Douglas was a complete wild man. And in Hawaii, he ended up in a, a pit trap for bulls. Um, and he ended up unfortunately dying in a, in a pit trap alone with a companion of a bull. But he, you know, he would, he would escape into, um, 
the wilderness and, you know, it was just filthy with rags hanging off of him and unshaven and unbathed. And, um, but he would collect these plants. And so that's, that's really fascinating with living here is that, and, and studying garden history is that, um, you know, I can go back to America where actually I'm flying into, um, America tomorrow, but, um, I look in, I look in American gardens and I see, oh, that, that plant hunter, that's that flax or whatever is from New Zealand, or that other plant there is from South Africa, or those that, you know, that rhododendron is from China. And so I know where a lot of, not, I know where many plants, there's so many out there that that came from all over the world, but most of them were um, Scottish and English um, men who were hired by nurseries to go out and bring them new, you know, bring them new plants from around the world is fascinating for those of you listening make sure you follow Catherine on twitter at Catherine alto and send her a, a maybe a visual image or link up with her because Catherine has the unique opportunity to travel all over and get that viewpoint and you can adapt and bring that home to your gardens wherever you may be it's kind of wild to see you know there's 45 countries listening to this Wow. So gardening in Singapore is very different than gardening in Australia. Or, you know, I live on the Great Lakes where we get all four seasons, sometimes in one day. But mm. uh, I want to talk briefly about you have a book coming out. I do. Um, uh, I am an author for Timber Press, and if um, your listeners are have green thumbs, they probably know Timber Press. Timber Press is the um, it's a the world's largest horticultural press based in Portland, Oregon. And I think since I was about 16, I wanted to write for Timber Press. Um, So it's been a few years in the making. It takes a while for proposals to go back and forth and so and so on. But um, in September of 2015, I have a book coming out called Exploring the Hundred Acre Wood, The Natural History of Winnie the Pooh. Um, So it's not a design book and it's not a botanical book. Um, it's a book, uh, f- uh, Timber Press is branching out into sort of natural and literary history. And this book follows a bestseller called Beatrix Potter's Gardening Life. So um, my book is, um, part one is about A.A. A. Milne and E.H. Shepherd, um, And part two is exploring 20 iconic places that take place in the books. So for example, um, I explore fun places like um, the Heffalump Trap and Winnie the Pooh's house and, um, oh gosh, Poostick's Bridge. And um, A. A. Milne was a great walker. He loved to get out into the landscape and walk, and, and he, had, uh, he lived on the edge of a forest. So all these stories actually took place in a real landscape. So I was wearing my garden historian's cap while writing this. Um, and then part three is a natural history visitor's guide to Ashdown Forest. So we look at butterflies and insects and places to walk and interesting stories about Charles Darwin and in the landscape and other people like Yates and Pound. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a visually rich book and um, yeah, it'd be hope, hope, hope people will be interested. I'd say congratulations, but that doesn't even begin, you know, to scratch the surface, you know, a lifelong dream fulfilled. It is. It is. It combined um, photography. I, I did, um, I took about 140 images or so, um, sleuthing. So there are about 30 historic images. And then the book is, um, we're using all the classic E.H. Shepard, very sweet uh, ink and sort of colored images. Um and and I I had so much fun writing it. I'm actually sad that it's it's um it's going into the design phase right now. But um, to say goodbye to all the writing, um, but that's okay. I'm thinking about the next book right now. You did your own photography. That's impressive. Yeah, um, we'll have a pretty good professional camera, and um, I needed to use a filter um, and a tripod. I have a macro lens and a. Um, um, and some other, a couple of other lenses which I used, um, and um, yeah, so there are close-up shots of bumblebee bums and um, beautiful flowers. Um, we we have lots of beautiful um, butterfly images we got from uh, English butterfly fanatics, and um, 
bird fanatics here. Bird watching is a very big thing in, in England, almost on par with gardening, it seems. So it's a it's a visually rich, really lovely uh, book, um, kind of on literary and natural history. And it comes out, what makes it special is it comes out during the 90th anniversary of the very first Winnie the Pooh book. Um, so A.A. A. Milne wrote, wrote um, poetry, then a prose book, then some poetry for children, and then a prose book. So this comes out comes out next September, like I mentioned, but it's ready to go for 2016. So 1926 was the year the very first Winnie the Pooh book came out, and it's it's sold millions and millions of copies. And so this is a really fresh new look at um, A. A. Milne and all the Winnie the Pooh stories. And yeah, I'm really excited. I'm really super duper excited. That is so cool. <laughs> I, I, I think I got a little aha moment there when you were talking about the imagery. Because yeah. one of the questions I've written down to ask you is, you walk into a client's space, mm. and you have to somehow conjure the muse. And I wanted to try to, like, I can't understand it. I don't have that ability. Or if I do, it's very weak and chaotic. How do you create these visual tapestries, I guess, first in your mind? Or is it a process? It's definitely a process. Um, I don't impose my own ideas on a space. I know what will grow there. Um, and I will, you know, tell the client, you know, through conversations what will grow, but I, I can tell you the process. Um, generally it's word of mouth, um, or Twitter. I get a lot of work through Twitter. I have to say, I could tell you a few of my projects later, uh, the ones I've done this year, but, um, so someone will contact me and they give me a brief idea of what they want to do. Um, and I visit the site and I listen to them. I listen to what their dreams are, what, how, they, how their family um, moves and interacts in, in a space or not. Um, maybe they don't move in a space because there's too much. It's like a goldfish bowl, for example, and they, they, from neighbors, and they need more privacy. So then we think vertically and that sort of thing. It's sort of um, in layers. Um, so then... Um, I get a, a client brief. Um, they tell me what they want. We have a conversation. It goes back and forth. And then I, I write back. I summarize to them in a, in a paragraph or, well, usually it ends up being about a letter and a half of what, they, what they're looking for in a rough budget. Um, and then I say the next phase is that I, I create a mood board. So I work visually there just with images. I just create like a poster with um, images. So, for example... Um, a garden that I've designed for some clients in Tinmouth, um, Devon, right on the right on the English Channel, um, sort of a seaside coastal home. <clears throat> they um, the uh, uh, husband is a is a British Airways pilot and um, flies all around the world. And when he comes home, he wants privacy, but they have two houses flanking each other, um, so they have an open lawn that they really don't use. Um, because they don't like to be out in the space because they can be seen. Um, so over time, you know, we built up what he'd want. Um, we, we, we want privacy. He wanted precision. He w wanted a very clean space. So, so I work with these ideas, clean, precision, n n no fuss, and he's very exact. Um, and his wife was on, 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 the, on the same page. Um, so they didn't want really a plantsman's garden, which would be very textural with lots of color and that sort of thing. Um, so for that mood board, I actually created, I put a scalp, I put a surgeon's scalpel on it, actually. And I put um, some uh, really modern, clean images of sort of Italian-esque gardens, um, boxwoods that he could sculpt that would be very geometric. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I can't remember everything I put in the mood board. And then... Um, um, I know that they wanted to entertain in the space too. So I think I put wine and fire. They want to have a fire pit. So then the mood board comes in and um, nothing really then from the client brief and the mood board, we work into different designs and how people move in the space. And once I have a sense of how people move and what they want to do in the space, I, I come up with um, probably three concept drawings um, this is what we could do here. If you want it geometric, then it, it, it eliminates um, sort of something more organic, um, sort of curves in the landscape. 
Um, so once, you know, we get client brief, mood board, um, design concepts that, that I put in front of them and they say, I like this, I don't like that. And, and a master plan is then put together based on um, in-person conversations about what they do and don't like. And, um, and then I start working with um, getting a master plan ready, a planting plan is put together, um, and then we find a contractor, and we're working with budgets. It's all within a budget, um, and um, and then the garden goes in. Order the plants, and um, the Tinmouth Garden part of it is now in, and it's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm really proud of that. But that's how it goes. Yeah. You know, Catherine, that was amazing. Uh, you'll have to hear this back. Like you capture words into visual images and we're just listening to you but there are people right now listening who live in giant cities with three containers on their apartment patio Mm. and imagining these green spaces and textures and precision lines and the mood board that that was awesome (laughs) i'm gonna steal that idea well, you can actually do that in a little, you can have a mood board for a balcony. You can have a mood board for, you know, a deck garden. You can have a mood board. Um, you, what it does is it keeps you, um, it keeps the gardener um, or the homeowner, or, uh, the client focused. They don't then go to the nursery and, and impulse buy, you know, a fuchsia or something like mm. that. Because the even though, you know, it's set out, at the front of the nursery for people to um, to impulse buy at a high price, might I add. Um, uh, mood boards keep you disciplined and controlled, and you know that it's been worked on. And it's like a prescription and um, a prescriptive plan, and so people feel confident, even if they see a fuchsia and they really like that color, uh-uh, it's not going to fit into the design. Um, and so people, that's what keeps things, that's where a good garden designer comes in, is they, they keep things, they remind the client of um, the master idea, the controlling idea, the big, the feeling. And so when people go off on tangents, you know, I can say, you know, is that, let, let's talk about that. And in, in some ways, it's, it's um, I love it so much because it's, uh, it involves psychology, um, it involves art, it involves the environment. Um, so I love, I adore the process. I absolutely adore it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, another garden I designed this year is for hospice. It's a hospice care garden um, in Devon. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really special place for people who have terminal illnesses. It's going in, um, uh, in about February. It's a delayed project from construction, but it's a brand new facility for people who... Um, can go for it it's just a day center so people can go but the garden is a very very big part of it um and so i um was really honored to 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 be named that garden designer and so um so for that garden we the big idea was a refuge a sanctuary an embrace and so that is not a hard geometric garden at all it's actually really enveloping we have a a circular area in the middle of the garden that's depressed uh, there's a depression area and people can go down and it's it is it does it's surrounded by boxwoods on the upper layer but when you go down there's a there's a, a sphere water fountain where water burbles out of a a, a, a sphere into um, rocks surrounding it and there are um, bespoke um, oak benches that are going in and we're having pillows put out there and um, so it has a more uh, subdued color palette with really lovely chocolate uh, burnt orange um, irises um, and some purple alliums and um, I created a sculpture for the garden too made out of um, corten steel um, and it's got perforated holes in it and it's uplit by, um, by lights um, and then the, the garden has a lot of lighting in it too that makes it really atmospheric and uh, you know still has art I work really from um, 
what will a garden look like in the winter? And I move backwards because I always want the garden to look good. Plants, the color is easy to put in later. It's what will the garden look like in the winter? So I always like to start there. Um, and, I, and I actually like to start with lighting too um, so that we know for sure that the garden is going to look good um, in the winter. In fact, when I have guests over, I always start with dessert. I make sure that the dessert is always done and ready to go. Uh, so even if I fail on um, you know, a salad or whatever, a side dish, that they leave with a good taste in their mouths, they, that dessert was done. It's kind of the same, uh, slightly the same thing. I, I like to have the final season um, that people often forget about because we're, we often think mainly color, color, color. I think really texturally, I, what does, you know, what, what do evergreen, um, what will the leaves look like all year round? What are the sounds? Um, like a painting, what will it look like, you know, November, December, January, February? Um, and then I pull back and, you know, start thinking about comfort. And, and then I bring in the plants. Plants, uh, the, I'm sorry, the color, the herbaceous perennials, those are easy. And, and then I begin to, um, it's like a painter who, you know, designs the painting with the pencil and sketches, and then you just add the final layer of color. Um, so that's, that's sort of the final, the final bit, actually. Let's take a minute to thank our sponsors and then come back and play five quick questions. What's the hottest trend in gardening? I think the hottest trend is aquaponics. Can you really grow a massive garden powered by fish? Find out more and discover the secrets to building fish-powered gardens. Get instant access at www.backtomygarden.com front slash fish. Attention landscape and garden designers. Special report reveals how to double your garden design business in 12 months or less. Discover 10 ways to attract better clients while reducing costs. Escape the day-to-day grind of doing all the work yourself. You get instant access and free download at www.backtomygarden.com front slash GD Top Secret. I'm letting out this sigh because our time is flying by. I mean, I feel like we barely started on second gear here. I could listen to you all afternoon and pick your brain. Uh, but now is the time in the show where we play a game called Five Quick Questions. Oh, no. Don't fear. This is your <laughs> chance to share your wisdom and experience with brand new novice gardeners. Are you, ah. ready? Are you ready to play? Oh, my goodness. Okay. I've okay. never heard these questions before. Okay. I got to get some music for the show. Dun, 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 or something like that. <laughs> Question number one. What do you think stops most brand new people from even trying gardening? Um, well, people are really getting into gardening a lot these days, but um, what stops people from gardening? Uh, probably these days, maybe distractions from social media and the internet and computers um, and being overworked. Mm. We forget that um, nature you know, the children these days have nature deficit disorder, or, you know, um, oh, that's a new, it's not a psychological term, it's just sort of a sociological term, I think, but we forget how important it is um, to, even looking outdoors at a, at a plant is important. So I think, I think um, to be, to have a really modern, modern answer, I think that um, we could be too, um, we need to get away from um, things that entertain us and uh, as spectators and get get into the real world and get our hands into the world instead of looking at it through a screen. Tremendous. Uh, question two. Oh, you've boy. got decades of experience and you've had some incredible teachers. Yes. What's the single best piece of gardening advice that you've ever received? Gardening or garden designing? Ooh, uh, there's no rules. We can do anything we want, so you pick. Um, okay, well, from part answer A, I'll give two answers. Answer A to the gardening section is, uh, the gardening question is, I'm not paraphrasing it exactly, but you have to have good soil. People will want to put a plant that, you know, it's from, that doesn't grow in clay soil, in clay soil. So you have to, um, you have to pay a lot of attention to what the soil is composed of. 
<clears throat> so I think that's the first, that's a gardening, it's a sort of an endemic gardening answer question. Um, and then in terms of design, I don't know where I heard this, maybe it could have been a voice in my head, but um, it is to, you know, to design a garden from winter backwards for structure and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's gold. I mean, I've not, <laughs> I hope the listeners write that down because I have it in the show notes. Work backwards from the dessert. What's it going to look like in winter? That would be a quote by Catherine Alto. <laughs> That's solid gold right there. Um, I'll have to introduce you to my friend Jeff Stonebanks. He's over in uh, Essex. He's on the oh, okay. coast there. It's all chalk. Yeah, it's chalk. It's beautiful white chalk. Yeah. We have the opposite problem. Well, not opposite, but we have red clay here. It, the, the, the hills, when farmers plow them up, it looks like paprika. It's really a dark iron. There's lots of iron in the soil. Yeah. Um, but for the, I referred to the Tinmouth Garden uh, for that British Airways pilot. And um, I had to dig out. I just said, the clay's got to go. We've got to get rid of the clay. Um, so, so much of the clay was dug out and replaced um, – with um you know really good really good soil amended and ah oh, rich nice. stuff <laughs> yeah uh, question three uh the internet novice gardeners are always learning do you have one or two websites that you like to reference uh, i know you mentioned timber press we'll put a link there i'll put a link to the rhs they have an amazing site yeah. Um, well, the RHS is really great. I uh, I generally refer to books. I have a really big library of um, garden design history um, and plant books. I've, I've sort of got it all here. I like to I like to thumb through things, but um, probably a couple. I mean, the RHS is great if I'm looking if I need something quick, some dimensions, and you know what sort of what kind of plant grows in a particular kind of soil, um, and um, the RHS, I would say crocus.co.uk is also really good. It's a big nursery, but the, the descriptions of plants are really good. And they also put in um, companion plants that will go with, you know, if you're looking up uh, a um, an Amelanchier tree, for example, an Amelanchier lamarckii, it'll say, well, uh, the website will say, well, this, this goes well with it. Um, so I like that because it gives me ideas. Um, I would also say um, there's an image, uh, uh, gapphotos.com um, or gapphotos.co.uk. I'm not quite sure which one it is. They have uh, photos. It's gardens and plants. Gap stands for gardens and plants. Um, and they have, I think, hundreds of thousands of images of gardens. And for the amateur gardener, that would be a great way to get inspiration. You can plug in any aspect of a garden, lavender, sunflowers, or whatever, and you'll get lots of images. And it just gives you sort of your own design ideas. Perfect. That's for me, because if I can see it, I can do it. I just have to get that image first. I'm so visual. Uh, but you hinted at question four. Uh, the best way to find good gardening books is to talk to a great gardener. Do you have one or two gardening books that you would say for a novice are must-reads or favorites? Oh, well, I do like Andrew Wilson's Influential Gardeners. I think the subtitle is The Garden, you know, the Designers Who Shape 20th Century Garden Style. Um, those are just kind of the movers and shakers uh, who um, initiated new trends. Um, and I also like anything by um, uh, Pete Aldoff. Um, and Pete Aldoff has written with Noel Kingsbury. So Noel Kingsbury is also a Timber Press author. Actually, Andrew Wilson is a Timber Press author as well. Um, I'm not quite sure if the Influential Gardener book... No, that's by Otter. That's In fact, I'm looking at it right now. It's by Otter. Um, so I would say Pete Aldoff, Noel Kingsbury, Andrew Wilson. Um, those are some of the key books. Um, I don't have a particular book. I, I tend to have particular um, writers or designers that I go for, and, and those are three of them there. Nice. I'll link to their Timber Press bios and Amazon. Yeah. Okay, question five is a fun one. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer. <laughs> is there anything that you've never grown that you're itching to try next season and play around with? Um... Um, yes, I would say um, I am designing 
for my front garden, we don't say yard here. It's, it's hard for me to even say front yard. Um, uh, I am designing a sort of slightly um, Italianate courtyard for my front garden. Um, and so I'd like it to be really textural with maybe one color, which is a, a purple allium. Um, so I wouldn't say there's a particular plant, but what I'm doing is I'm focusing right now just on texture because I, again, I want the garden to look beautiful all year round and I just want the alliums and maybe a couple of other plants, but with a really reduced planting or color palette. Um, cause I, I like, I like my eye to settle and I like kind of my spirit to settle in a landscape. I don't like my eye bouncing around. So I'm not going to do a plantsman's garden. The challenge is, um, leaf texture and different levels. So for example, something that is at my head level, uh, shoulder level, waist, knee, and ankle level. I sort of design that way. Um, so there's something interesting at all those different levels. Um, so that's my challenge is, uh, finding different textural elements at those different levels. (laughs) I have to tell you, I am truly humbled. Like I love doing these podcasts because of the variety of brilliant gardeners I get to meet. Mm. Like your, your concept of Vertical, like I've never I conceptualized that before. Like mm-hmm. head height, having the eye settle on a texture, like it's wow, fantastic stuff. Well, beyond that is um, as a term called a borrowed landscape, and that is um, so. Say something uh, in you can see something beyond your garden walls, um, like some trees, you know, on the top of a hill or a mountain covered with snow, and so you want to design around that. You want to keep that so-called borrowed landscape in view it's almost like a a backdrop to the garden so you can also design around that so even beyond ankle knee waist shoulder it's you know head height there's the um the garden uh the 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 vantage points uh, beyond the garden that you want to preserve um so that's that's something that um you know say for example uh you know there's a uh a beautiful oak tree in a, in a garden and it, you know, it, um, you, you want to, you know, maybe design around that or yeah, that kind of thing. So there's more than just beyond, um, you know, what's in the garden that we want to think about. Fantastic. Uh, for those of you listening on the home game, make sure I told you it was going to be a great episode. Follow Catherine on Twitter at Catherine Alto. Remember there's two A's in Alto. Also have a link to Catherine's uh, website at www.catherinealto.com. We have to have you back. I know with the book coming out next year, it will help you with that build up and share the message. Thank you, Dave. You've been a brilliant guest. Thanks, Dave. (laughs) I want to give you the last word to the listeners, from the novices with patio gardens and balconies all the way up to the experienced gardeners. Can you leave us with either... A pearl of wisdom or note of encouragement on our gardening adventures? Oh, my goodness. Um, I would say when you're designing your garden, I'll, I'll speak from a designer perspective. When, when, when you're thinking about what kind of garden you want, maybe cho- look, at, look around your house and choose an object of desire, something you really like. It could be the design of a garlic press to the color of a candle or maybe something, a painting that you like and ask yourself, why do you really like that object? Um, Compare it with others and then put three together and find out, oh, you know what? I really, this is, I really like this because of this, this particular part of that design or that object appeals to me. And that will probably translate to a garden. So for example, if you like a very minimalist, modern garlic press, for example, it may be that um, you want something very minimal um, in your garden. Um, And I would say um, the creative process is chaotic by nature and um, let it, let it go. Um, You know, don't enjoy drafting and drafting and sitting on something and then going back to it. Don't, don't ever rush a design Um, and um, let it have many layers and, and, if you can afford uh, to talk to a, a garden designer, we're not all that expensive. Um, we're great to talk to, and it's 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 really worth talking to a designer too. So um, that was a long answer, Dave. But um, 
hope hope there's a pearl of wisdom in there somewhere. <laughs> You've been brilliant, Catherine. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Dave.